Okay, thanks again. And welcome back this morning. Um, as you remember, yesterday we discussed quite a lot about um, the construction of pro matrix product states, issues of normalization, compression, um, norm and, and related issues. Uh, we look, had a look already at time evolution algorithms because this is the simplest thing to do in some sense. Uh, we also discussed long range time evolutions a little bit. Um, so what I want to do today is basically uh, continue in some sense with the topic of time evolution um, to lighten up the whole thing. I put in some application, which is a couple of years old, but there's lots of pictures. So I used that one to show you the power of quantum simulation based on these um, methods. After that, I will move on to discuss two topics, again related to time evolution, namely uh, what do you do to work at finite temperature and what do you do um, to overcome this problem of uh, time limitations. This is currently an active field of research, obviously, because this is something what we don't want. You will see in the application that the methods are currently limited to relatively short uh, times. Um, there are some ideas which are too early to be presented. For a special class of problems, there is already a very successful technique of extending time evolution to the future, uh, which I will show. Um, and then finally, I will um, discuss sort of like what many people would have thought is the most fundamental thing, but in my view is not how to obtain a ground states. Um, this will mainly be a discussion about how to construct the matrix product operator of a Hamiltonian so that you get a general idea how to write down these guys when it's more complicated. Because unlike the states which are produced by the algorithms, um, the operator somehow you have to encode by hand. Okay, and then uh, finally I want to show in the remaining time, whatever this is, um, the application of a DMRG, matrix product states, in the context of the dynamical mean field theory, which is a method that is best in higher dimensions um, and can address real materials nowadays, but has certain bottlenecks, and there might be a chance that this type of methods we have been discussing yesterday and will be discussing today are going to overcome this issue. Well, in certain cases and other me methods in other cases, we will have to see. Okay, so um, one thing which we have not covered yet, which however is very important, is if I have a state, I mean, what do I do with the state? Ultimately, I want to be able to evaluate um, observables. And that's a topic we haven't discussed yet. Or we want to calculate the overlap between two quantum states, um, which, is an, which is, as you will see, a very closely related question. So the slide that comes is a little bit full, but we will see that it's ultimately relatively simple. Um, what you have to do is um, say I want to calculate the overlap of two states, I psi at time t and psi at time zero. I may call this state phi, just to have simpler notation. So what I have to do is I have to draw the matrix product state of psi, that's the object down here, and then I have to draw the bra, and the bra is all these um, um, all these coefficients complex conjugated, so in our picture it's the same thing, just that the legs pull, um, point downwards. So this is then the matrix product state for the bra phi or psi of t or whatever you want. We will get to that expression in a second. So in order to evaluate that, what you have to do is in our graphical notation is to evaluate all the contractions here. And I put arrows here everywhere where you have one of these contractions. And then, of course, the big question comes up, in which order do you do these contractions? For example, you could say, well, because this is a physical object, the state psi, so what I do is I do all these contractions here first. Then perhaps I do all these contractions here first. And ultimately, I contract the two states. That would be one way of doing it. But then if you look at it, if you did it that way, what happens is 
that of course here you have matrix matrix multiplications that's what the contractions mean but at the same time you have the physical legs sticking out and um, and, and you have to do this contraction for each configuration of the physical legs which means as there are for spin one half there would be two to the power l um, spin configurations, that means you would have to carry out an exponential number of these contractions to be able to write down state psi. In effect, this would bring us back to the standard notation with the expansion coefficients c. So that's certainly not what you want to do. You would lose all the advantages of the method. But what you can do is you can do perhaps both graphically or in a formula, people understand it better in different ways depending on the, uh, them. Um, let's have a look first at the analytical formula and then we look at it in the picture. Um, this is again this overlap formula. So and I have written down explicitly the MPS for state psi. This is this object here. And that's the sum over these sigmas and that's the bra. It's the sum of the computational basis here and these are the matrices that go with the state um, phi just complex uh, conjugated in order to get the, well, to get the bra. So, of course, this whole thing collapses into an um, overlap of the basis. This is an orthonormal basis, so it's just a single sum of this product of matrices. And of course, ultimately, it's a one times one matrix if you look at the dimensions. But what you can do now is, okay, this is just rewriting this expression here. What you can do is, as this is a number that we know, because this is one of these expansion coefficients, the transpose of a number is just the number itself. So what you can do is, you can take this entire expression and transpose it, which turns it into this expression here. So the stars turn into daggers and the order of the, sequ uh, the sequence of the matrices gets inverted. The usual rule that A, B daggered is B dagger, A dagger, nothing more. And now what you can do now is that you see that the sum over sigma one just concerns these two matrices, just like you see it here. The sum over the sigma two con concerns the two matrices adjacent to that. So it gets an onion-like structure and unlike the onion, which you peel from outside, here you work your way from the inside to the outside in the following way. You carry out this object here. This is a matrix matrix multiplication. Well, in that special case, it's actually a vector vector multiplication, but this is just the spe specialty of the first site. In general, we are talking here about a matrix matrix multiplication that costs third power of the dimension of the matrix. You have to do this for each of the local states, lowercase d, and then you have to do this entire thing here because this gives you a matrix. Then you have to evaluate that object here, then the next one, and so on and so forth. You have to do this of the order of L times. If you are more precise, you would find that it's 2L minus 1 because you get a product of three matrices in general which you carry out as a, B times C in, as, 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 in the C, as a sequence of two matrix pro, uh, multiplications. But anyways, the, the important point is that now the cost of evaluating the entire set of calculations has collapsed from being exponential to being a small power in the size of the matrices. And that's of course what you need. Otherwise, the entire advantage of the method would have um, disappeared. If you want to look at it graphically, you go up here and you think of it um, like a zipper, where so basically you first, you start here, this is the zipper basically, you start here, you first contract these two guys here, so it's this contraction, then you next contract into it this object, then this one, then this one, then this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on and so forth. So you move through the zipper um, and do one contraction after another. So in this case, we know that this is the way to do it. The interesting point is that in, um, in 
higher dimensional generalizations of these states, uh, there's of course the same issue. What is the best order of contracting it to get down my numerical costs from something which is um, done naively exponential and therefore useless to some reasonable power law. And the interesting thing is in higher dimensions, unlike in one dimension, um, it's not clear what the optimal way is. There are, of course, now strategies to do that, which you will find in the literature, but some people proved actually that from the mathematical perspective, the uh, question of the optimal, optimal contraction in, in, in two and more dimensions, if you write more complicated networks, um, is NP hard or NP complete? Perhaps someone might know here, I've forgotten. But anyways, NP whatever means that it's one of the problems you don't want to deal with. So, or you are extremely smart um, and have the right intuition how to do this. Here in this case, we are on easy ground. Okay, so that's how you do that. And now you have the overlap of two states very efficiently. And now the question comes up, how would I work out, for example, an expectation value? I could also look at matrix elements like writing a phi here. This doesn't make any difference. Now, this is shown in the picture down here. What you do is, say here it's even shown for a two-point correlator. You just sandwich in the local operator at the point where it belongs. Say that would be an SCI and that would be an SCJ. So this network, which is shown here, would basically give you the expectation value SCI, SCJ, and allow you to work out correlation functions. So, and, and, and the, the, the amount of calculational effort is essentially the same as here. It's just that instead of having just one contraction here, you have one contraction here and one contraction there. But these are actually the cheap contractions. The expensive ones are the, or comparatively expensive ones are the ones sitting here. So um, that's how you would look at two-point correlators um, or higher order correlators or even simpler ones like a local density. And the question is, if we look at two-point correlators because they are so important for us, what form will they take? And I will not go through the motions of the mathematical proof, but what you can imagine is, assume your system is really, really big, then you would assume that the state it has has some kind of, say, translational invariance, well, which may be broken into some periodicity or so. But let's assume uh, for, for our intuition that it's a translationally invariant state. So basically these matrices, they will look the same on each side, ignoring now the ends. So, and then what it means in the contraction, I can also consider this object E here. And so the, the contraction is basically a multiplication of one E after another, which takes us from here to there. That means that what you have here is something which is more or less like, as I said, I would just want to appeal to your intuition. You have something which looks like a transfer matrix, which gets you sort of like from one basically site uh, to the next, just as you know it from statistical mechanics. And then of course, sort of like this connects your operators and this transfer matrix will then somehow basically generate um, the, the, the decay of the correlation. And if you remember, and this is the mathematical form, we don't have to, to go into that. And if you remember the one dimensional easing model, which I guess all of you at one point in your life solved by a transfer matrix method, you will remember that transfer matrix methods consistently produce exponential decays except for cases of degeneracy of eigenvalues, and it's the same here. With the additional except, uh, point that it may be that the, eigen, the leading eigenvalue of this transfer operator is one, then of course the correlation will not decay at all. Um, so what matrix product states generically produce as correlations is, um, a superposition of exponentials because I mean this, this will be a huge object. It will have many eigenvalues which each of them drives an exponential decay. So the, the correlators that you get are either long ranged or superpositions of exponentials. That's an important point in the sense that you would also like to look at systems which ultimately are critical, which have power laws. And the point is the power law, you will never get 
fully to 100%, which also, by the way, shows that a matrix product state for a critical system in the thermodynamic limit would have infinite dimensions, so the compression will not work. This does not mean, this is for mathematical proofs, it's relevant for any finite system size, that's okay, because what you will observe in practice, say here this is the, the log of the correlator, which you are looking at, say spin, spin, and this is the log of the distance, and D is taken to be, in some sense, smaller than the entire system size, so that you don't have to look at um, finite size effects, and this is, of course, taken to be large. That can be many hundreds um, easily. Then what you will find is that these exponential decays, they conspire, so to say, to produce a power law. So what it will look like is, is what, you, what you expect. And then at some point, all the fast exponential decays will have died out, and only the strongest or the slowest exponential, well, you should say not strongest, the slowest exponential decay will survive, and then you will be found out that in reality you're only looking at a superposition of exponentials, and ultimately it will go down like this, uh, because then it turns into an, a single exponential. So if you now increase the accuracy of your um, of your simulation, rerun everything, with a larger matrix dimension, what you will find is you get the same curve, and then it continues for longer until it bends down. If you increase the accuracy even further, it looks like this, but sort of like to get f further and further, of course, you pay a steeper and steeper price, but what you can then reliably extract is say here, okay, this is power law, and from this I get my power alpha, and that's it. So in this way, sort of like matrix product states um, are also able um, to deal with um, um, critical situations. In higher dimensions, actually, it's already built in into the um, structure of the networks themselves. So in practice, one knows how to handle that. Good. So this is, this, we now use this entire machinery um, to, to look at a physical example. Well, for this, I have to go here. And what I want to show to you is an idea which is now almost 10 years old that was uh, an idea to use ultra-cold atoms as a dynamical quantum simulator. At that point in time, there had been lots of experiments which were called quantum simulators, but they were essentially about static properties. And then people said, well, uh, if, I, if I think about a flight simulator, I mean, this is something dynamical, there's something happening. So what you want to do is a dynamical quantum simulator, for example, to look at issues like a relaxation and thermalization of quantum systems, which is a big research topic these days. Um, the big advantage of an experiment with ultra-cold atoms is that the, the dynamic stays coherent for really comparatively long time scales. Solids uh, decohere very fast. The problem, of course, at that time was you want, of course, to be able to study what happens to a quantum state as it evolves in time. You have to be able to prepare it in a controlled fashion. Otherwise, you do, don't know what you are talking about and you have to be able to carry out local measurements. And many of you might know that in the meantime, there are these kind of atomic microscopes uh, in this ultra-cold atom business where you can really look at one lattice site after another. This was developed um, in the, uh, around 2010, 11, 12. It's now a widely used technique, but still the systems where you can apply it are uh, too small to really see kind of emerging thermodynamic um, behavior. As you probably know from numerical simulations to see thermodynamics, you often don't need the 10 to the 23 sites. Uh, often 100 is way enough to see what's going to happen. Not always, of course, but let's say 10 usually is not. And so in some sense, this is still kind of... Um, uh, this kind of proposal I am discussing is still the one which you would use probably most of the time. Um, so, and the point was that at that time there was a first um, idea of how to do local measurements in a very restricted way, namely by superimposing on these optical lattices, which is just a sinus-like curve, another one, a super lattice with period two, 
as you can see it here. And that gives you a bunch of double wells. And by shifting these lattices around, you can also introduce um, potential biases. So that's a staggered, uh, that you get a staggered double well. And this um, people in Bloch's group, um, I mean, I think he was here. I don't think he told you about these things. What they used it for was they were able to load patterns in a way which I will not explain right now. So they could come up, for example, with that on each odd side, they could place an atom and every um, even side would be empty. And by playing around with the staggered potential bias, they were also able to say not where each individual atom sits, um, but they would be able to say so many atoms sit on odd lattice sites and so many atoms sit on even lattice sites. And that gave us the idea to propose um, an experiment along the following lines. You use their technique to prepare um, a lattice where you have an atom on every second site. Then you switch off the super lattice, then this is what you have. Um, then the Hamiltonian that guides this situation is a simple Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, and this is not an eigenstate of it. So what will happen is they will start running around, and ultimately they will spread out evenly, and they do not double, it's just that the yellow looks the same up here. It should be half as yellowish, um, because of course it means that on average you will have a density of 0.5, and then you want to see how does this happen. Okay, and in fact, the experimentalists carried this out, and I always love to show this uh, picture here, um, because, you know, I mean, most of the, you are theoreticians here, I guess, uh, and I hope the experimentalists are not insulted. There is nowadays um, this a tendency that in experiments you try to produce one very beautiful figure with, with, uh, with the higher artists, whatever, um, we have a resident artist, actually. Um, and then, um, sort of like, because they hope to make it on the title page in, in one of these magazines. Um, and, uh, and, and that's from the experiment. And if you look at that picture, I think you will all agree that no resident artist has been working on that. Um, the point why I show it in this context is that the editor invented uh, the title bosons chill out because, you know, they relax. We will look at a relaxation experiment. Um, if, if you know anything about the statistical physics of this business, you realize that what these guys do while chilling is they heat up a lot. So uh, that's why I like to show it. Actually, this relaxation is related to heating up, and maybe in the course of the summer school you came across such phenomena because this is very generic. Anyways, what the experimentalists managed was really to look at, say, 45,000 atoms or so arranged in many one-dimensional wires, each of them containing sort of 100 hundred atoms or something like this. And they have this measurement technique, which I will not explain here, which allows them to measure in time. Let's say I had all odd sides empty in the beginning following our proposal. And then, of course, what happens, they will start moving and ultimately go to one half, but there will be an overshooting and a relaxation and so on and so forth. That curve actually is quite boring. We will get more exciting ones. But of course, the big point is this is really a time-resolved um, uh, relaxation or dynamical experiment in a strongly interacting system where really these atoms talk to each other. That's the Hubbard U um, of the bosons in that picture. They can actually vary it between whatever, 1 and 20 or something. So really, that's a nice thing. You can look at Hubbard physics very nicely here. So um, what we did is, and this is the interesting mi mixture um, that in this kind of theory experiment collaborations, you have a very weird thing. On the one hand, the limitations of classical computers will mean that we will certainly not be able to go do as much as one of these analog quantum simulators in the experiment does, because that's a quantum device. Our computer program is not. 
On the other hand, these experiments are very complicated, so they are quite desperate for validation that actually the experiment does what they think it should do. So this is something what you see here. We gauged it on the densities because this is what here. Yeah. We used their experimental parameters. This here, this small one down here, is the fact that they have confining trap potentials. Otherwise, these atoms start running away out of these optical lattices. Um, and if you take all that into account, let's focus on B and C. I don't have the time here to go into explaining why you have small deviations here. Um, but sort of like what you see is up to the times we can reach, um, the agreement is really very good without using a single free fit parameter. This is really an ab initio simulation of the physical situation you encounter here. Nothing has been uh, fitted or fixed or anything. This is sort of like raw data against raw data. Um, in that sense, we were very proud of that, but you, as you see, the time range of the experiment is much larger, which takes us to the topic, which I will discuss a bit later. How can we perhaps predict from what we have here what's going to happen in the future? And the reason why we cannot get any further is that because of these particles moving forth and back, the entanglement in the wave function is growing so much that ultimately um, the simulation collapses relatively fast. The entanglement grows linearly in time um, and therefore the bond dimensions or matrix dimensions grow exponential, um, exponentially in time. And at that time, 2011 or whenever we did this simul simulation, 2012, uh, we had to stop at around three or 4,000 as the matrix dimension. Nowadays, I think I could push that to 40, 50,000 easily. But honestly, what that would gain you is probably that you gave it gets, let's say, somewhere like here. So you get perhaps one oscillation more. So I mean, this is, as you know, I mean, that's what exponential laws are like. It's fine until you hit the wall and then you hit it real fast. So that's the same here. Okay, so that was, of course, not what got us so totally excited. But uh, uh, what we also had calculated just for fun, because the experimentalist originally told us well, they could only measure densities at best. We had calculated, of course, just using these standard techniques, um, the nearest neighbor correlators. And what you see here, as they involve in time, originally they all start out at zero because it's a product state, which you have um, originally of these atoms sitting there. And then depending on the Hubbard U, um, the behavior is quite different. Um, uh, if, if they are non-interact, if they're extremely strongly or non-interacting, it just stays flat. Um, otherwise, it goes up and then it saturates to some value, which is depending on the U. The imaginary part is then the current which dies off as the experiment settles down. Um, so this is picture is a little bit confusing perhaps. So let's extract these long time converged um, numbers and plot them as a function of the interaction strength u. And then what you see is there's an interesting non-monotonic behavior of the quantum correlations that are being built up um, in this experiment. I mean, these atoms uh, meet each other and then they build up um, correlations and there seems to be a u where they do it most strongly and then it dies off again. This one over U behavior for large U, one can actually understand quite easily by perturbation theory. Um, this stuff here, I can anticipate it's perhaps one of you guys has a great idea, still isn't understood um, where this comes from. Of course, you can say, yeah, because the physical mechanism here is different than the one here, but Okay, yeah, sh sure, but uh, can, we, can we make this more um, precise? But okay, so we had calculated that for fun. Um, we had also looked at the currents, and that also shows you the advantages and limitations um, of these methods. So let's focus on the amplitude of the current. They had invented a beautiful technique how to extract currents. Um, and what you see here is that's the current they measure. The, 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 the circles and dots, and that's the uh, result of our numerical simulation. The wiggles actually are here because you have to average over um, tubes of different size in these kind of arrays of one-dimensional experiments which are being carried out at the same time. 
But anyways, what you see, given that we have a strongly interacting many body problem, the agreement looks very good. And if you plot, plot it as a power law plot, you would even think that the current decay might be a power law in that situation. That, interestingly enough, is still an open research question because, um, uh, of course, I mean, this is less than one decade. And you know for a power law, you should have three decades or so. We numerically can certainly not access it so far, nor can the experimentalists because the current is simply becoming too weak. So that would be another case for being able to longer times would put theory into an advantage again because for the experiment you simply get the problem that the amplitude will be unmeasurable at some point. Um, the fun thing is I may anticipate the only theoretical explanation I have seen so far that convinces me slightly is unpublished work by Peter Reimann in Bielefeld. Um, he, however, finds that it should be exponential. So this is really an open question because uh, we see that we are really hitting current limitations. And if I tell you, yeah, with present day methods, I could get perhaps up to here. Yeah, that would not really make a big difference uh, for this prediction. But anyways, um, what we can predict and which shows the extreme power of this method is that at some point the experimentalists said now we can also measure nearest neighbor correlations. They could relate it to the visibility in that experiment and that's what they came up with. This is this curve. That's the long time nearest neighbor correlator as a function of the interaction strength u. One sees that quantum coherence is being built up from a uh, from a product state against potential de decoherence mechanisms. Actually, one can show that decoherence in this experiment will probably become only relevant after 100 to 1,000 um, of oscillations. So really, at, at times far off the graph, I mean, the graph goes this direction. Now, here is no time-dependent graph, but you know what I mean. It's far off, probably somewhere in the Mediterranean. Okay, so, um, and now you look at what we had predicted. And that's what they find, of course, in totally different units. So we, we got totally excited when we saw that curve. And then we worked out the factors. Uh, and then there was a little moment of disappointment, namely that that's the theory and that's the experiment. So the experiment shows a much stronger quantum correlation than theory predicts. There is no factor of two in between which we missed out. But, um, there is also not the usual argument that, yeah, that experiment has some noise and whatever, and therefore the effect is not so strong as predicted by theory, because it's just the other way around. Um, but um, ultimately, it turned out that the, the discrepancy was that we were actually comparing two different things which we had thought would be the same, namely, as I mentioned, there's this small confining trap potential, which in our original fund calculation we had not put in because we didn't know what it, would be what it would look like anyways. We had just put the particles in a box. And in fact, for the density calculations, this makes no difference whatsoever of any relevance. And so we thought that's the same here. If you look at the nearest neighbor correlation in the center of this trap, what does it care about what's going on far away? Well, that's not the case. If you build in the trap into the simulation, you realize that the result is ultra sensitive to it. That's what Emmanuel and co measured. That's what we had predicted as the long time result. And now I show how this builds up as a function of time. So the circles are what they measure and ultimately ends up here. And we, of course, cannot go to this long time, really. But what we can say is we can sort of like predict as long as we can. And this is, in fact, what, uh, what we get if we do the full simulation with the full, exper with the full experimental setup. Again, without, fi without fitting any free parameter. And I think the agreement is, is really good. And this shows that these quantum simulators can be extremely sensitive to details and that both experiment and um, theory, however, are nowadays able to trace those. And in fact, the physical explanation here in this case is extremely simple um, because the difference between having a box external potential 
um, or uh, this confining trap means that in the box sort of like the particles spread out and then they hit a hard wall whereas if they're in a parabolic trap potential they basically evolve a density like this and as there is no hard wall the particles can sort of like move up um, move up the potential energy that of course costs energy in an energy conserving world you have to get it from somewhere where is that that's the kinetic energy and the expression for the kinetic energy in the Hubbard model the atomic physics guys always use J instead of our T because they need T for time um, so but you, what you see is that um, in order to reduce the kinetic energy you have to make this correlator bigger and this is exactly what happens. This is why in the presence of the trap, um, the nearest neighbor correlators evolve to be higher than if you neglect the trap. So that just as an example of what you can do. And um, I think there might be more analytical and theoretical work coming up in that direction. Um, uh, but that's still an open subject. Actually, we might be revisiting it uh, because we have some idea how to do longer times there. Um, okay, now I want to motivate what perhaps for the solid state guys here in the audience, um, probably the majority in some sense, um, is totally natural uh, that you want to work at finite temperature. So for example, this is the structure function of a one-dimensional spin chain obtained by the Proholm group in uh, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. Um, on a one-dimensional spin chain where you see, you see here this is what you usually know from a spin one-half Heisenberg chain this is the, the, the spin-on continuum which you see here in the absence of a magnetic field but probably nowadays this is quite old picture uh, you can do this much more clearly but the point I want to make here is that of course what you are interested in what happens if you expose the whole thing to a, a magnetic field and as nowadays we have reactors which, which have extremely high neutron flux and very precise instruments, what you have as opposed to the past where you were mainly interested in asking where is the peak sitting, you can now actually not just say where is the peak, but you can very precisely measure the line shape around the peak. And there's lots of information in line shapes which we can now finally access. Okay, so this calls for precision calculations, but the problem is if you look at the size of the field, typically magnetic fields are not very strong in some units. Um, 10 Tesla, 20 Tesla is now something many labs have more or less. Um, but if you, and the most extreme cases are um, magnets that are at 80 to 100 Tesla, they sometimes pulsed or destructive and so on and so forth. Um, so getting really strong magnetic fields is an issue and the question is of course strong compared to what? And then if you, um, if you look at it, um, then the experiments are usually at the temperature of liquid helium the energies, the magnetic energies of these chains are very often of something like the order of 10 Kelvin or so nowadays. So definitely if you compare that, these scales, we cannot reasonably say that we do a zero temperature calculation. There have been spin chains in the past where the interaction was say 1000 Kelvin, then 4 Kelvin for all practical purposes is zero. And then um, why are people no longer just looking at these spin chains with 1,000 Kelvin as interaction strength, well, because um, in order to see interesting physics, of course, they have to be competing scales, so field and interaction should be not totally different. And then, because there's this rule of thumb, one Kelvin is one Tesla, um, that means that you want such things and experiment at these temperatures. So we definitely need algorithms that work at finite temperature. Um, the ultra-cold atoms, as soon as you turn to, turn to fermions instead of bosons, by the way, are not particularly cold either. In, co in fact, compared to, to sort of like metals at room temperature, um, they are really hot, yeah. Um, if, if you work out what the relevant scales are. Okay, so the question is, um, what do you do about that? And there is a technique which goes back in mathematical physics actually several decades, 
and was brought into that field in, uh, we, I'm talking about in this PRL from 2004, exactly in the context of this introduction of the um, products, matrix product state tensor network picture. And it's an idea called purification. And it just states, perhaps I do that on the blackboard, this one line, it just states that um, Let's assume you have a, a mixed quantum state. Then it's, it's described by some um, density operator rho. Let's assume we know it. And this density operator rho has the form that it's rho i, 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 where I assume that I'm able to express it in its eigenbasis. Well, that's not necessarily the case, but let's pretend it is. And then it, there's a very simple way of, put, of phrasing this in the language of pure quantum states. Let me give this a P for physical. And now um, let's write down the following state, psi. This lives on the physical space. And the state psi lives on something which I call physical plus auxiliary space, which has the following form. So um, I double my physical system. So say, assume I have a spin chain, then the physical state space would be the Hilbert space of the spin chain. Now I say I introduce, simply I put here another spin chain, and I call its Hilbert space auxiliary space. And then these states I, they I, P, they live here. And I say similar states, I A live here. I just take them to be copies. And then I say, well, I assume this is the product, this is the state of this bigger system. And now if I want to have row P, this is just the trace over the auxiliary degrees of freedom of psi P A, psi P A. I mean, basically what you do is you convert that from um, uh, ket into bra, so you get this, and you sum over these i's, so that that disappears, and um, the square root of rho i gets multiplied with itself, so it turns into rho i. And that's it. Um, this idea is called purification. I think it's shown again on the next slide, but perhaps it's better to see this on the, um, on the blackboard. And now what it means is that the entire machinery we have developed up, uh, up to now can also be applied uh, to finite temperature. You just have to be able to find the state psi which encodes the information of your mixed state. Because then you can do time evolution, say, on the state psi, which then mimics the time evolution of your density operator rho, and so on and so forth. The price you pay is that from, say, a spin chain, you go to two spin chains as the object of your simulation and, and the like. OK, here, that's what I just um, put on the blackboard once again. And so what I want to focus on is on these formulae down here. They look a little bit complicated, but in fact, they are very simple. Because what you see is, ultimately, I want to do expectation values and to do time evolutions. So that's the expectation value with respect to the, reduced, uh, to the density operator rho. That's the famous tr trace O rho formula. Then the rho is this trace over the auxiliary, I call it unfortunately here Q, or here I call it A, is the trace Q of the projector. It's just this expression here. Okay, now as this is an operator on the physical state space and this is an operator on the, uh, acts on the auxiliary state space, I can invert their order. So I have an, a trace over all of state space of this object here. And now I use the cyclicity of the trace. And then this whole thing here, I move that into the front. The whole thing here turns into a normal expectation value and the trace disappears. So which means that you don't even have to modify your code. You can recycle your code for expectation values. Same thing for time evolution. 
That's the von Neumann equation for the evolution of a density operator. I replace the density operator by its uh, trace expression, the one here. Then again, this is uh, auxiliary state space. This acts on the physical one, so I can pull the trace out. So I have trace of Q over e to the minus i h t psi, and this is simply psi of t, and that's the associated bra. So what I have to do is I do the same thing as before. It's the same expression for a density operator. So again, the expectation values work as always. And the thing I have to do quite intuitively is, well, I do a time evolution once again on a pure quantum state. Again, something which we programmed. I mean, that's what we have been discussing yesterday. That means we can do real-time evolution. We can do expectation values uh, as if if, and that's of course the big if, if we know um, the row of, p, uh, row of p at some time zero, say. Yes? Uh, that we will get in a second, because what you do is you build in the temperature uh, to, uh, to, to get the state. Yeah? Um, for a given state, um, for a given state, well, I mean, the question is whether a temperature would actually be defined. Yeah? Um, that makes equilibrium assumptions. Um, so, uh, but, the, but the point, the question is, of course, good because, um, as was asked, what about the temperature? Well, in principle, the mixed state can be anything. It need not be a thermal state, but that's, of course, the application we are perhaps most interested in. So the question is, how do you build it? And the thermal state, of course, is, I mean, because you see, I say I can do everything if I know rho. Well, but if I know rho, I don't need the computer. Yeah? The problem is that I don't know rho, yeah, usually. So I, well, I, I mean, can write it down, but that doesn't help me. Okay, I, um, and so for a thermal state, it's actually very easy to get, get from writing it down to actually doing it. The thermal state is, of course, e to the minus beta h. And I write this in the fancy way that I say I write this as e to the minus beta h over 2 times the identity operator times um, e to the minus beta h over 2. Okay, so if I'm able to come up with the uh, pure state representation, so the purification of that object here, I am back to what I already know. Let's say that would be the pure state representation of the identity operator. Let's look at it in a second. But then it's just, again, a usual time evolution, but just now in imaginary time, not in real time, uh, and only up to beta over 2. That's how I would construct it. So if you give me this guy here, I am done, because I, if I have the possibility to do real-time evolution, I can also do imaginary time evolution. In fact, it turns out imaginary is much nicer, because uh, as opposed to a unitary time evolution, which conserves errors once they are in there, um, the, the advantage of an imaginary time evolution is basically that, in some sense, it's a projection down to the low energy states. And therefore, any errors get also partially projected out again. So it's, it's much better behaved um, than, uh, than real-time evolution. So, But we still have to come up with the purification of the infinite temperature state. And let me do that uh, um, on the blackboard. Because let's just do it for the simplest possible case because, you know, an infinite temperature state is a product state. So every, every uh, state has exactly the same weight. So, um, or, the inf or let's say the other way around, the infinite temperature density operator is um, simply one over the dimension of the Hilbert space all along on the diagonal. So, and that means in the special case uh, of infinite temperature that the infinite temperature density operator is basically the product, the tensor product of the infinite temperature density operator just for one side. You can work that out to see because this is just, the, uh, I think, quite trivial. You can physically think about all correlations being killed off. But this is mathematically rigorous. And now let's think about a spin one half. There, rho infinity 
on one side would be just one half, one, one, or let's put it one half, one half here. Okay, that's the infinite temperature uh, density operator. And now to purify that is actually very simple. Just think about the following state. Which here, this is the spin on the physical space and what did I call it, Q or A, a Q on the auxiliary. And if you look at that state and you trace it over Q, what you get is just um, uh, one half up, up, plus down, down. So this totally mixed state, which is typical for t equals infinity, is just the trace over a maximally entangled state where each of the combinations has exactly the same weight. So what you have here is that um, what you have to write down is a maximally entangled state, which means it's just sort of like this combination. Every state in P is combined with its partner state in Q, and they all have the same weight, and that's it. That's your starting state. And then you pu purify it uh, by taking the trace. So total maximally mixed comes from maximally entangled after this uh, tracing process. By the way, the whole thing works also if, say, I pair the up with the down here and the down with the up, and instead of the plus, I make a minus because the tracing will, of course, multiply this prefactor with itself, so any phase, um, a phase will disappear. Um, and that state, for example, would have the advantage, the singlet state, that you could see that it has SC total equals zero and total spin also zero, which allows you, if your code has good quantum numbers, um, also to play that computational advantage. But conceptually, it doesn't make any difference. So, but this means we are able to write down by hand what the infinite temperature purified state looks like. And then, so we are set, we then do the imaginary time evolution up to beta half, and then we do real time evolution as much as we want. And in fact, there's also something which you should watch out as uh, what happens on the auxiliary state space only serves the purpose of uh, giving us the possibility to trace over the basis of the auxiliary state space. You can do there whatever you want. So what people nowadays do is um, they introduce arbitrary unitary evolutions on Q um, when they do the real-time evolution. This helps a lot to bring down entanglement. Um, here in this picture, I will not fully explain it, but just sort of like as a guide for the eye, if you, if you do this smart thing, the, the sort of like the times you can reach simply inc are increased a lot. Just if you look at the times here, the colors are about accuracies. You see here we are talking about 8, 10, and then suddenly you are talking about times 20 or so. Um, so in, in, in a special application, but that's very, very generic. And the, the transformation which you usually do is, is if you have a time evolution e to the minus ht on the physical, as the first kind of trick of doing something better is that you do e to the minus minus ht on the auxiliary state space. This helps you saving lots of computational effort. Okay, if anyone is interested, I can discuss this um, in the break or so. But this is just a trick which you, which you use. Okay, so that's what you do for uh, thermal states. I will, I will show pictures after the next topic, and that's the last one which I will discuss before the break, is that what we now are able to do is um, we are able to calculate um, pure states time evolution. With this trick, we are also able to calculate mixed state time evolutions. And in the particular case of thermal states, we also know how to construct them by an imaginary time evolution um, and this purification technique. So 
we have everything at hand, but the problem still remains that we do not have very long times at hand because of entanglement growth. And one situation where this is particularly relevant is that you very often are interested in observable or correlators like, say, S plus on some site um, X and some time T, S minus at site zero, say the center of a spin chain or so, at time zero. That's, these are and similar things in Green's functions. That's what you are interested in, because what you want to do is you want to do a double Fourier transform to arrive at something as S, at S plus minus K omega, the structure function. So, or kind of a, 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 a Green's function in frequency momentum space. I mean, these are standard quantities that experimentalists measure. If you remember the picture I showed of Colin Proholm's experiment, um, what ARPES measures uh, for the more electron-oriented guys, and so on and so forth. That's, these are typical quantities. And now the problem is the resolution in, in frequency space will not be good if your times are relatively short. I mean, the, 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 that's simply a property of the Fourier transform because what you can do is you can, of course, do something really awful, like say I have the t data up to time t and then I continue the data by zero. Then, of course, the Fourier transform will ma have mainly wiggles because of this jump. Okay, no one is so stupid. So what people do is they introduce damping factors e to the minus eta t I think you all know these factors from field theory um, or many body theory where you say eta is zero plus or something. But then of course, if time is short and you need that factor to basically um, dampen out your signal because you can't calculate it for long times, unfortunately eta is not zero plus epsilon but it's appreciably large. Um, and then the Fourier transform, what happens is um, Say you have your line shape, which would look like this. And what your Fourier transform, we'll see a picture of that in a second. Your Fourier transform will give you something like that. And then, of course, you are totally unable to uh, extract anything about line shapes. Do you get the peak right? Yes, but the line shape information is totally lost. OK, so one idea which is very helpful in certain cases is the following. What your computer program gives you is, as time evolves, it gives you for all these quantities values at certain time steps. So you have a time series. And quite generically, the time series, I call it Xn. Yeah? And then, of course, at some point you stop. And now you would, log you would want to know what happens to the time series here. And the ansatz which you use, um, and engineers have been doing much smarter things along these lines for many decades, but this ansatz is very often the one that does it in physics. You say the next point in the time series is a linear combination with some coefficients ai of the p preceding um, time steps. So this one here is a linear combination of, say, these five which precede it. Okay, you can always say something like this. The point is, of course, that you say that the coefficients which allow this prediction of the next uh, point in the time series, that these coefficients are constants. Because, I mean, otherwise uh, they are different here, 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 and here. It's useless. Okay, so if you make this assumption, which is pretty wild, admittedly, then, of course, you can take your raw data, which you have, and use it to determine what um, the coefficients ai are that match your ansatz best. If you find at that point that it's hard to match the ansatz uh, uh, with a small error, then of course probably the ansatz is wrong anyways, but that gives you a first indication, but let's assume you find um, you find that you can do that with a small error, so you, in, in mo modern language you would say you learn these coefficients ai from the data, well, it's a just, least, it's just a least squared error fit in practice. Um, then you can use this ansatz, of course, and take your last data points which you have from your calculation 
use it to predict the next one, and then use that to predict again the next one, the next one, the next one, and like this, you basically, you, you can proceed as long in time as you wish. Of course, it may be total rubbish, uh, depending the nature of the ansatz. But in this way, you can continue it. Okay, what do we get? And in fact, um, the results can be pretty impressive. Here I take the transverse easing model. The transverse easing model is a good case because you can work it out exactly. And there's very few numerical techniques that fail on the easing model. So in some sense, the predictive power is perhaps not that high, but anyways. Um, so what I take is, is um, I calculate S of K and T, which means I have carried out the Fourier transform to momentum space, but not yet the one to frequency space. There I stay in the time domain. And so the numerical data were taken up to time 10. Well, just for fun. But that we could probably do for much longer times. And then sort of like this was used to, to fit the coefficients and predict the future. And what you see here is for various k values, the exact curve, the DMRG results up to here. Um, this was actually at finite temperature, beta equals 10 and 50. Um, and that's the prediction for the future. I must admit I've forgotten whether this picture was for 10 or for 50, but it's the same essentially. And what you see is the agreement is really good, and that's the inset is the error. And we are talking about extremely small errors here of this prediction. Admittedly, the signal at some point is very small too. But, rely, but we can really say that this allows you to extend the time domain of your simulation easily by a factor of 10 or even more, which means that your frequency resolution, on the other hand, gets better by a factor 10 or more. And in that particular case, what you get is, this is for these various k values, that's what the line shape looks like as a function of frequency. Let's focus, say, 50 is actually the case, well, it doesn't matter. So sort of like 50 is what you have here in this old shape here is what um, old methods had given that already also sort of worked on the data. It's not a raw data Fourier transform, so some, some brain power has already gone into producing this curve. And then if you use this prediction, what you get instead is this curve, the dark blue one, and the dots you see here are the exact results from analytics, which means that the, this linear prediction technique in this case is absolutely able to get you the analytically exact result. So the transfer is easing model is perhaps a simple model. So we looked, we have used this technique and other groups have now used this technique in many circumstances. I show this picture here because um, uh, it, for, for analytical reasons that I will explain on the next slide, the case of the spin-on continuum in a spin one half chain should be the particularly hard case for this method. Um, and so this was, an ex was in collaboration with Bella Lake. Was, wasn't Bella here? This plot has been shown. This plot has been shown. OK. No need for explanations. But, then, but what you see is, so I can cut the story short, is that that's Bella's date, date, data. And um, what you see here in black is our stuff. And what you see in blue was the next best uh, theory. Yeah. So I mean. I think this needs not really much comment, yeah. Um, I like particularly the one here, E. So um, the agreement is, is, is really extremely good. And we are currently, actually, I was still waiting. Because, um, that's the problem. If you have a PhD student, not I, that was an experimentalist group. If uh, the PhD student that later on that goes to work in industry and the paper is not yet finished, then you are in for the long wait. Um, and this is sort of like, that's a collaboration with Christian Rueck, whom some of you might know. And they have very beautiful experiments on crossover compounds, which is um, spin systems which, depending on temperature, um, have a behavior that goes from being one-dimensional over two-dimensional to three-dimensional. 
and sort of like, and we, we they measure that now with extremely high accuracy. It's embarrassingly high. Um, we have never had such a demanding partner for no, for fits of uh, numerical data like Christian because their data is now so ultra precise. Um, and they can see this cross, these crossover phenomena. I think we have simulations at 4 Kelvin up to 40 Kelvin, an entire range of temperatures, and the agreement is, will be, is absolutely perfect. Um, unfortunately, they have one peak where there is still a discrepancy of 0.4% between uh, our data and theirs, and they get totally excited about this last data point. So, I mean, I would say I don't care, 0.4%, but I, they, for some reason, are excited. And the problem has now been resolved, actually, so they had a point, yeah, I have to admit that. Um, and, and it's now we are waiting for this former PhD student to finish one plot. Um, watch out for that paper. It will be my name on it and Christian Rueck, and there you will see that this um, linear prediction is now ultra powerful to do something like spectral functions. So in the last sentence was important because you may wonder why did I do this prediction of S of K and T? Well, I mean, I have raw data S of X and T. Why don't I apply this linear prediction technique to S of X and T? Well, for a good reason. Or to the density data, which I showed you with this ultra-cold atom experiment. I mean, if you look at the times, at that time we already had this linear prediction technique. Why didn't we just use it and tell Emmanuel Bloch and these other people what's going to happen? Well, the reason is that of course, it's an ansatz. And as every ansatz, it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work. And if you work out the mathematics, what you find is that this ansatz is able to produce time series. Here again, I use index instead of an, a bracket T because that's the way we have the data. What you get is, in simple words, a superposition of exponential decays. They may oscillate. So there may be imaginary parts and real parts in the exponents, but it's an exponential decay ultimately. If your data has this form, then you are in good shape with this linear prediction. Otherwise, you have to use other ansatzes. This is, by the way, a totally underdeveloped field. In physics, engineers have been doing a lot on that. Um, might be interesting for some of you. Um, but if you look, for example, at a Green's function in momentum space, I think most of you at some point in your studies have seen some object like this. Um, this is the uh, single particle energy at momentum k, and then you have the infamous self-energy which corrects that. It contains both the shift in energy and the lifetime. And if you take that and Fourier transform it back from frequency into real-time space, but you stay in momentum space, you get for example, if that has a single pole, you get simply a single exponential decay at the position of the pole. And if you have several poles, well, then you get a superposition of such decays. And this is why this method works. Whenever you have uh, one of these typical Green's function-like structures, this linear prediction technique will do it for you. And the case why I say the spin-ons is a complicated case is because this has all been worked out analytically. There's entire books uh, on, on, on that. There you don't have a few single poles, but you have an entire branch cut. So a continuum of infinite number of poles. And so that poses a challenge to this method. But it seems that this branch cut is very well approximated by, say, 10, 15 poles, which conspire um, to show what the, what the branch cut does. So this is really a method I recommend to you because it's so cheap in programming and so cheap in application, uh, given that these time evolutions can be extremely time consuming, orders of days to weeks or even months if you are patient, and this then does th stuff for you in milliseconds. Okay, so I would say at this point we make the break for five minutes, and then the next thing will be ground states. And then probably my present day application will be a bit short, but I think it's better to know how it works instead of just flashing pictures. Okay, thanks for your attention, and if there are questions now, ask them now. So now everyone seems happy. There were more questions yesterday. Either because you have understood everything or I have totally lost you by now, whatever.
Sorry? Like the technique? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I know it under the name of linear prediction. Actually, you find all this in a chapter of the numerical recipes, which it seems people had not read uh, carefully enough beforehand. Well, no, it's sort of like um, people, they, there are people in physics who studied engineering beforehand. And they tell me that you are tortured as an engineer. You are tortured with the analysis of time series endlessly. So this is actually, I really think one, what one should do is, and honestly, I haven't found the time to do it. I should try to nail down one of these engineers, professors at, say, Munich Technical University. We have a bunch of these. Um, and, and nail them down and say, what do you do? Because engineers, very often, they have extremely complicated machinery where you have no way of really fully calculating it. So they measure stuff. And then they use these time series to whatever, do some extrapolations. And they have developed a huge set. It just seems that the linear prediction, of course, hits onto, um, how should I say, in some sense, on, on the, a situation which is extremely important and frequently occurring in physics. Yeah? But for example, if you apply this, I did that with Steve White for fun on this density data, which we had produced for these ultra-cold atoms. And there, basically, what happened, the density, well, it oscillated, and it went close to 0.5. And then it started oscillating more strongly again. And so very clearly, the ansatz was totally useless in that point, because it simply doesn't fit where well, I've switched the slide. It doesn't fit the form. Perhaps it's called time series analysis. But I, I don't know, wherever you are now at British University, check out whether there are engineers. They should be able to recognize that and help you along. Yeah. I once had a set of lecture notes, but they were handwritten and so many errors that I didn't from one of these lectures of engineers, so I didn't get anywhere from there. It was too, whatever, too, too chaotic. Um, but that was not the fault of the lecture, I guess, but of the notes. Um, but please go for it. I think this is really interesting. Another interesting aspect which I may mention, because I've been discussing that with many people, like Jörg Schmidmeier in Vienna, Frank Verstrate in Ghent, um, that in effect what this linear prediction does, in some sense it produces you effective theories for a very complicated quantum many body problem. And in physics, we are generically interested in producing effective theories, like high energy physics. I mean, is standard model, is this the reality? Well, probably not. It's an effective model of what is really going on in our range of energies, which we can currently reach. In that sense, so all of physics, in some sense, is about building effective theories. And the question is, could one use um, could one use techniques like this linear prediction or something similar um, to have a situation where you have the full microscopic description, say you have your Hamiltonian, or you have extremely precise measurement data which you can analyze with such techniques and use it to build, say, an effective theory from that, an effective field theory which you extract numerically and then work with that. Whether it's useful or not, I don't know. But this is an, an idea which has been around for several years now. And none of us actually was either didn't get around to it or was not able to come up with more than this conceptual idea. But there might be something interesting there. OK, but now five minute break. <laughs>
aus den So, um, let's now come to um, ground state searches. And so, for like ground state searches, I will actually do at a relatively pictorial level because the details um, are, well, they are not difficult, but they kind of assay just lots of indices. Um, but the fundamental idea is much, much simpler and can be very well represented in these pictures. So, I want for a given Hamiltonian, I want to find the matrix product state of some given dimension that minimizes the energy. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. I turn this into a, a, a Lagrangian multiplier problem, which I think you all are familiar with, that where the minimum of this is the minimum of that one, and actually the lambda is then effectively um, this quotient um, you are looking for. So. Um, in graphical notation, this means that I have to minimize this expression here, and this is psi. This is the MPO for H. Let's assume for a second that we already know it. I will get to that point in a second. And that's again psi. So that's psi H psi minus lambda times psi psi. Now, the problem of minimizing this is that all the entries of these matrices are unknown, and they are being multiplied to each other, so this is an extremely highly multilinear problem. Uh, and we don't really know how to do this um, properly. <clears throat> so the technique, and this is actually the thing that was invented a long time before people thought about it in this way, was that what you can do, it you can do the minimization variationally, with respect to just one of these matrices. So you take the derivative with respect to one of the matrices and say it, everything has to, the derivative has to be zero. And then of course you do this with respect to all the matrices and, and find out what's going on. So take, as the matrix here pops up linearly, taking a, a derivative with respect to it means in the picture that you just remove it. Well, I mean, the derivative of 5x is 5. The x has disappeared. So, and the same thing, of course, in the psi, psi. Actually, I take the derivative not to, with respect to the matrix A, but to the matrix A star. And that's actually not the same thing as a, taking it with respect to A, because you know for, for complex numbers, you can either say I treat real and imaginary parts separately, or I treat C and C star separately. Yeah, and that's the approach um, one, of course, typically uses. So, and that has to be zero. So, in the unknown object you want to improve is, of course, the, the, the complex conjugate of this matrix, which was um, sitting here. And which means that it's basically this matrix multiplied by all the other stuff, which you take fixed, to be fixed for the time being, minus lambda, there's again this matrix times this stuff around there. Sorry, I have to sneeze. Let me switch off. Uh, so this, uh, this is what you have here is a generalized eigenvalue problem. Um, this thing, uh, sort of like this is A times X minus lambda times, let me call this other stuff here, n times x, and I'm looking for x. Now, this is not what you want 
a generalized eigenvalue problem is harder to solve than a standard one. And it may depend crucially on the numerical conditioning um, of this matrix which you have around here or the stuff which is multiplied uh, to it. And this can in practice be really bad and then your algorithm will converge very slowly or not at all. What you want is you want to take it back to a standard eigenvalue problem. And this again brings us to the topic which I insisted so much upon yesterday, which here is absolutely crucial. Um, you want one, a, a matrix product state in this mixed normalization. And I want it in that form that when I'm looking at this matrix here, all these guys to the left are these type A matrices and all the ones to the right are the type B matrices. Because as we saw yesterday, then this structure here will collapse and this structure here will also totally collapse. And wh what you end up with is some matrix whatever multiplied to this object minus lambda mal this object is zero and this is just a standard eigenvalue problem. And this eigenvalue problem um, you then solve because you are only interested in the extremum, um, you are only interested in the lowest eigenvalue that comes out. Um, so what you use is methods like Lanzosch or Jacoby Davidson or typical large sparse matrix solvers because it turns out that most of these entries are zero anyway and the objects are huge. Because think about this object here, you will reshape it into a vector and how big is it? A typical MPS calculation a dimension might be say 1000. So what you would get is 1000 times 1000 times say the local state space dimension Hubbard model would be four. So it would be a vector of length four million. So this object here multiplied to this thing which you reshape as a vector has dimension four million times four million. And of course this means there's no way of doing a kind of a standard diagonalization. But methods like Lanzosch or Jacoby Davidson work extremely well because as I said, there's lots of internal structure here, which means that uh, most of the matrix elements are zero and the op the, this operation of multiplying is becoming very fast. Okay, that's what you do. And the point is of course, um, here is again this operation here in, in full gory detail with numbers, but of course what you do is, I just said, now I explain now how to optimize a single matrix and what you are really interested in is of course, um, you have to optimize everywhere. So what you do is you combine many of these steps so you start out perhaps with a random initial state or you guess something in a smart way. There are methods for doing that. Actually most of the time people nowadays start with something random and then you sweep this hot site where you want to optimize the matrix. You sweep it forth and back because if you optimize only once, I mean you do this in the presence of the other matrices which have not yet been optimized. So you have to do this several times until all the matrices are at their best. Um, in practice, this can be tens of times. Um, you have to monitor this very carefully um, because I've seen quite, this is one of the major sources of error in application that people at some point say I stopped this sweeping procedures going through all the matrices forth and back because I'm sort of getting bored um, and, and, and then the result might not be converged or even worse I've seen cases where people stopped uh, when the result looked like what they wanted to see anyways. Um, and where kind of continuing to do it would have been a little bit of a disappointment. So anyways, but in order to stay at the simple eigenvalue problem, you have to do that in the mixed normalization, which means while you are moving through the chain in order to optimize these matrices, you do not do that, you do not pick them randomly, but you really go forth and back like with the zipper and, and at the same time shifting the normalization. That's what we learned yesterday where we learned how to 
turn the AAA BBB notation into the one where sort of like you have converted one A into a B or vice versa. This technique is actually what you, do, what you use at that point to always stay within a sing, simple eigenvalue problem. And this is actually why I don't show you explicit formulae because as you remember from yesterday, that's not totally easy and trivial to write down, but that's exactly what you, what you need here. That's what I already mentioned. You optimize um, the local matrices by solving an eigenvalue problem and the convergence, which I just mentioned, um, you have to monitor. Um, there is various ways of um, doing it. One way of doing it is by looking at um, the variance of the expectation value of the energy. If this goes down to zero, you know that you are in an eigenstate uh, and the hope is that it's actually the ground state. Well, I mean, that you usually then see from other indications. Uh, Lanzosch and these methods have a very strong pull towards the ground state, but, but of course, if you are, have degeneracies or states with an extremely small gap, um, uh, that might be problematic. Perhaps a, a last remark, what I have just described in sort of like old-fashioned language would be an algorithm where you have a block of A matrices and a block of B matrices on the right, and you focus on one matrix in the center. In, in the old literature, this is called single site BMRG, and what was originally invented was a modification of that uh, method where you basically um, move two, two sites next to each other, left and right, that in fact at the end involves an additional singular value decomposition. Um, that's the so-called two-site DMRG. Um, if you ever stumble across discussions relating the two, both of these methods have advantages and disadvantages. Actually, in extremely complicated calculations, like I'm currently doing something with Steve uh, White on the 2D Hubbard model. He uses the two-side DMRG. Our code mainly uses the single-side DMRG. I mean, we can both switch, but sort of like we have more experience respectively, and we need that desperately to check the convergence of each other's uh, results because this method here is uh, slower this, there's a higher count, calculational count in this method. Um, this method, in principle, is much faster by a factor, depends, four or five. Um, uh, it, it can be shown mathematically to give you the variational optimum. This method cannot, but, and this is the awful uh, thing, very often being variationally optimal in a numerical algorithm means that it's very unstable, to, uh, that it's very subtle in its convergence behavior. Because if you, if you say you have an algorithm that lands you into a, a, a local minimum and you actually want to go to the global minimum, um, sort of like if the algorithm is really sort of like working perfectly, uh, then the consequence is you stay stuck here. Yeah? If the algorithm is not so perfect, you have a hope um, that you get out again and get into the real minimum. So quite a lot of effort has gone into developing uh, techniques which are now very successful of preventing that in this method. Um, still, what we find is that the approach to convergence in these really complicated 2D systems, in 1D I would say don't care, it's all relatively simple. Um, in these very complicated 2D systems, the approach to convergence seems to be faster in this method. So what we sometimes do is because as we approach convergence, we make the calculations bigger and bigger to get the last um, digits, so to say. But sometimes we say we start with this one to get us relatively quickly to something useful, and then when the calculation becomes very complicated, and when we think that the convergence issues are mostly resolved, then sort of like we switch uh, to this algorithm to do the fine remaining details or we use them as completely independent checks. So that's a topic which I would say in one dimension is not so important, 
um, in two dimensions, it's really sort of like a relatively subtle topic, which currently we do not fully understand. So what we do is we basically uh, check um, each, other's, um, each other's results to see whether we get the same thing. Okay, so that brings me to the last slide of this part of my present, no, unfortunately not. Well, I mean, probably this means that instead of rushing everything through uh, in the last uh, minutes, I will sort of like, those of you who, who want to see this DMFT, uh, DMRG, MPS application have to wait for another talk or for the paper, which hopefully comes out uh, soon. And I will rather spend the last, say, 10 minutes on explaining uh, a bit more about how to build MPOs, and then we have time for questions, and then you have listened to me long enough anyways. So um, what I want to do now is to, um, to construct a matrix product operator for a Hamiltonian. I don't know whether Miles exposed you to that, perhaps. I saw one blackboard on the terrace floor where basically the construction I'm going to show you was put on the blackboard. So some people have at least already discussed it. So what I want to do is, is um, at, in some sense you would think that a Hamiltonian which is a relatively complicated object. So what we write is something like SI, SI plus one. You know, that's a typical simple Heisenberg Hamiltonian. But what this really is, is first of all, this is a sum of one half S plus S minus plus one half S minus S plus plus SC, SC. And each of these terms here in reality is a string one times one times one times uh, the identity s plus s minus times one times whatever. And um, then you do a, you have sums of those. So basically in that Hamiltonian for a chain of length L, you would have three L terms of that form. And then you may also have a field HSCI that gives you yet another bunch of these strings. And so while it, it's obvious how to construct something like this, there the matrix product operator is simply a, um, um, a chain of, of one times one matrices. So the, 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 the matrix, the matrix M sigma one sigma one prime to produce this would be simply delta sigma one sigma one prime built as a one times one matrix. And this object here would be M say sigma I sigma I prime would be um, sigma I S plus I sigma I prime. And again, it's, it's just because of like, of course you can turn that into a matrix, um, but here the label of the matrix is, uh, the labels are put up here, so you really decompose that into a bunch of matrices that each of them are just a number. So in that sense, you, you see that you can construct each of these strings of operators, but then you have to combine them, um, you com have to combine them to a big MPO and one way actually of doing that would be to say, well, um, I, I construct these three L operators. Each of them are very simple. And then the Hamiltonian is just um, the sum of these operators which I have constructed as MPOs. And like with MPS, um, actually, and the, no, sorry. And the, the way you do that is basically you would take these matrices and build a big one. Actually, don't worry about that too much. That's not the way you should do it. Um, but that would be the most naive way that you say, well, if I put each of these, um, in that case, one times one matrices into a big one on this diagonal, say, and I do that on each side. And if I multiply them together, this guy will be multiplied with this one, with this one, that one with one here, one here. So ultimately, this will give you exactly this string of, um, of matrices being multiplied together for string one and so on and so forth. Uh, 
But what that would mean is that the dimension of the MPO would become really large. So in that case, for this, for this Heisenberg model, even without a field, you would have three times L of these operator strings. So that would be the dimension of the MPO. So it would be the dimension of the MPO would be, say, 300 if you have a chain of length 100. And that becomes unmanageably large. And in fact, it's totally a useless way of doing it because what I will show, show now on the blackboard is that the real answer is, the optimal answer is that the dimension of the matrix product operator for the Heisenberg chain, including magnetic fields, and it can everything also be inhomogeneous with disorder, whatever you want, is just five, and it's totally independent of length. So how do you do that? Um, and the way to do that is Actually, in some sense, the best way is to do it pictorially and say I, I make a slight change of notation that I say sort of like um, uh, I, 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 I turn these matrices with their indices M sigma I sigma I prime, which you see here on the right-hand side, um, that I turn those guys Oops, uh, um, that I turn these guys of like I read them as operators. So then the this Hamiltonian I'm looking for will have this form. But that's sort of like just to keep the notation simple. The main idea which you have to understand is the following. I think of the I think of my 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 construction principle like a little automaton that moves through my chain say that's my chain, 1 to L. It moves through the, through this, um, through the chain and it builds up an operator um, which is part of the Hamiltonian and it does it in a way that ultimately when the automaton has worked its way through the entire chain, it has constructed the entire Hamiltonian, all terms that are in there. And so and the way you do that is um, in this, in this automaton has internal states. There have been papers also connecting that to cellular automata and this sort of stuff. Um, there, it has internal states and I say it's internal state, the first one is one. It sits, that's the state it has when the automaton sits here, sort of like a neutral starting state. And then it moves past site L, it moves to here. So what can happen on site L? So the first thing is that could happen is um, the, the, the automaton encounters a term with a magnetic field. So this is the, the term HSC, uh, which it might encounter. So if that is the case, um, you are complete because this is a complete string. So after that, like if it hits, if it hits on an HSC term, there may only be identity operators as it moves further through the chain because this is already one of the, uh, the strings of the Hamiltonian. So if it, lend, if it gets into this final state, which is five, I mean, I know that it will be five. After that, so like once it is in this final state, it means the only thing that can happen is identity operators until I am at the end of my, 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 my chain. So what might also happen is that the automaton doesn't find anything happening here. Like if you look at this string, here there's lots of identities before it actually starts hitting onto an operator. So it may stay in, one, in its state one if it walks past an identity operator. Okay, that's sort of like what also may happen. But what may also happen is that the automaton encounters either an SC, an S plus or an S minus. 
So let's S C S plus S minus. And this puts it into different, into new internal states, which are called two, three, and four. And why does it need these internal states? It needs these internal states because what we know from the structure of our Hamiltonian is that if I have a term SC, it needs to be immediately complemented by the next SC term. And the S plus must be complemented by the S minus and so forth. So what we immediately know that in the next step, here we will get another SC, say JSC, because these guy have, guys have an interaction strength. The S plus has to be complemented by J2 S minus, and the S minus has to be complemented by J over 2 S plus to complete the, um, complete the interaction term of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Once you have done that, after that, if you move further through the chain, only identities may occur. And this is already what we have here. You are in this final state. So here is start, and here it's final. And what you may do as a little exercise is just take a Heisenberg model on a three-spin chain. I mean, one is, a two is a little bit too trivial, I think. Um, take that and just write down the full Hamiltonian, all the strings that pop up, it's not that many. It's nine without a field, 12 with a field, um, and see whether your automaton will sort of like reproduce all of them if it goes through this diagram. So that's sort of like where you can check that this is actually what it does. And so now the question is, how do I translate that picture into, um, into uh, an MPO. And that's shown on the next slide. Okay. So let me first discuss the case when I'm in the center of the chain, meaning not on site one and on site L. On site, so what if, if I multiply these matrices together to give me my full MPO, means I go in here because I come from the right and I go out there. And so if I now label this these internal states, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, meaning what can happen if I have one? One can take me to one, then I have to put the identity operator here. One can take me to two. Well, here I have switched notation a little bit between SC plus minus if you compare it to there. I stay now with the picture I have on the blackboard. So it's SC, S plus, S minus, and I get into state five which with H, S, uh, S, C. So now if I am arriving in state two, the only thing that can happen is J, S, C, which takes me into state five. Three, it must be J half, S minus. Four, it must be J, two, J over two, S plus. And five, once you are in five in the final state, it's just the identity. And all the rest is zero. That you have this lower triangular form, you can always ensure in this construction. So this is the sort of like the MPO matrix somewhere in the chain, and because this sometimes creates a little bit of confusion, because normally you write something like M sigma i, sigma i prime, and it has indices i, j. This is sort of like the notation we introduced. How does this relate to this one? Well, it's basically that you say I take, um, mm, I take of this matrix M i, uh, M i I take the entries um, i, j, which gives me an operator, because it's operator valued. And of this operator, sort of like the entries are then sigma i, sigma i plus 1, or sigma i, j uh, prime, sorry. But this is a detail. Yeah, but don't get too worried about that. So the, this is the picture you have. And now the point is, how do you get into the whole thing? 
So, well, in the beginning, in the beginning, you always start from state one if your automaton sits to the right. So the, on the, the, the matrix which you have on side L is just the first column. So this is now on side L, and this is just the first column which goes down to HSC. And now on, state, on side one, you have to finish in state five. So what you have is basically on state, uh, side one, you get a vector HSC all the way to the identity, this object down here. And you see if you multiply these guys with many of those, with that one, you exactly get a string of operators as you want to have it in a Hamiltonian. And you can work out that it's exactly the ones that you want. That's sort of like how you can really by hand construct the MPO um, for, a, for a Hamiltonian. And um, what you see is uh, you can now immediately understand what it would look like for a Hubbard model. The Hubbard model at first sight might be much more complicated, but the complication that you have a larger local state space is contained in the definitions of these operators which you put here. But for our automaton, it's actually very simple. Um, the automaton might find for the Hubbard model, for example, um, that, and that you have, what do you have? You have C dagger spin up, you have C dagger spin down, you have C annihilators up, annihilator down, and these of course must be complemented by C dagger, by C dagger, as by C down, and this one by C dagger up, C down up. These are the four pairings you get in a, in a, in a, in a Hubbard in a Hubbard model, I mean the usual expression that you write T sum sigma ci sigma uh, i plus one sigma dagger plus Hermitian conjugate. So the sigma gives you two and the Hermitian conjugate gives you two. That's the fact uh, altogether four. Well, what does this mean? Instead of these three guys, you get those four guys. So what you need is you need an additional internal state, and so the final one will be six. So the dimension of the MPO for a Hubbard model would just be one more than for the, uh, for the Heisenberg model. If you have longer ranged interactions, there are sort of like tricks how to keep this manageable, um, because uh, what you have is now if you have, for example, um, You have, for example, a term like in a frustrated model, you have typically objects like S plus I, S minus, S minus I plus one with a J one plus J two or one half, doesn't really matter. S plus I, this, um, uh, let me write it differently. S I minus one, S I minus two, S I minus, yeah? Sort of like, a nearest neighbor and a next nearest neighbor term. And so what you have to make a distinction is, let's say your system takes you with an S minus I into an internal state um, two, you may either complement it immediately by one half J one S plus I minus one, or you may, you, you may jump into that term which means that you need an identity operator on site I minus one, which takes you in a state two prime of this automaton, and then sort of like it is being complemented by one half J two S plus um, I minus two, and then we are here in the final state. So you see longer ranged interactions have the consequence that you pump up the dimension of the matrix product operator because you need internal states to bridge the identities that are appearing between the operators. So and you see if you had a J3, you would have to introduce a T2 two, two prime and that would have to go to a two, three prime because you need two identities because they are three sides apart, and then you complete it, and you see 
you can do something like this for short long range interactions or beyond nearest neighbor, but ultimately this becomes sort of like quite a nuisance just without writing it on the blackboard. What the technique is that people use there is you can find out that you can do exponentially decaying interactions without any additional numerical effort in the MPO representation. And then what people do is they use a bunch of exponentially decaying interactions to basically mimic um, the true behavior of the interactions. And sometimes this works extremely well. One qu yeah, question. Yes. Um, uh, that's a very good question. Let's put it like this, I can't do it, but this might be a, limit, uh, might be a limitation of my brain power. Um, whether, there is a fundamental, whether there is a fundamental reason that you can't do it, I don't know. You might, of course, you will have a problem of multiple connectivity. That might be a reason that you can actually show that it's not possible, but I would be very careful with pronouncing no-go theorems here in a situation where I honestly haven't really worked it out. I mean, what people here usually do is, in that context, they do not represent H, but they rather represent local objects for observables, or they represent the, uh, the H um, by trotterization to do imaginary time evolution to go to ground states, something like this. Yeah. Um, I would be, I, I would be, I mean, I, I must admit in a different context, um, I, I tried something similar and there I sort of like at some point I got totally stuck. Yeah, and then I, I was so confused with all the indices that I cannot say whether it was just me or whether it's impossible in general. There might be such a reasoning that it is indeed uh, impossible in higher dimensions. It works, of course, if you look at sort of like tree tensor networks or so, anything which doesn't have sort of like loops um, in, in the network, there I think it should work extremely well. It's just that it will look more complicated, but uh, there's a reasonable ordering you can introduce. Okay, and basically, um, in some sense, we already entered the question session now because this brings me, if I look at the time, uh, to the end of my presentation. I could not show the application which would have come next. Well, that has to wait for next time. I thank you for, uh, for your attention for four hours. And then I'm, of course, open for questions. Thank you very much.